The crimes committed by Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, shocked the nation. Hindley has been demonized as the most evil woman in Britain. Along with her lover, Ian Brady, Hindley took part in the abduction, sexual abuse, torture, and murder of five innocent children. She was sentenced to life imprisonment, and Hindley's supporters claimed that she would not have been capable of murder without the influence of Brad. Was Hindley indoctrinated into being in Brady's murderous world? Or was she quite simply born to kill? This is Unsolved Files, a place where crime stories are being brought to your doorstep. What are you waiting for? Just hit the subscribe button for more fascinating and suspense-filled crime stories. Now let's get back into the story and uncover this mystery. Myra Hindley died in prison on November 15, 2002, at the age of 60 years after serving 33 years. Myra and Ian might have carried on torturing, sexually assaulting, and killing children if it had not been for one man, David Smith, and his confession at Hyde Police Station on October 7, 1965. David had witnessed Ian's brutal murder of their fifth victim, Edward Evans. David Smith had the reputation of being a neighborhood hard man. He'd started dating Myra's sister, Maureen. They got married and moved to the nearby Hatter's Bee estate, close to Ian and Myra. The four of them spent a lot of time together. David was impressed by Ian's right-wing views, and slowly he became indoctrinated into Ian's perverse view of life. Brady had been grooming Myra's brother-in-law for several months, and was confident he could trust the 17-year-old to not only keep a secret, but also to become actively involved in their murderous plans. But Brady miscalculated David. David and Maureen's story was taken seriously by the police. Two dozen officers were called to Ian and Mira's house. Little did they realize that the police were about to stumble across one of Britain's most notorious criminal cases, the Moore's murders. As it then, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey have mysteriously went missing from the area six months earlier, David Smith told the police that Ian had joked about burying children on the moors. Police believed that the bodies of four missing children might have been buried on the moors. Their fears were well-founded, because on the 10th of October 1965, the body of Leslie Ann Downey was discovered. Eleven days later, the body of 12-year-old John Kilbride was also uncovered. John had disappeared without a trace on November 11, 1963. In 1965, a case like this was unique. For the first time in British history, a woman had been implicated in a killing partnership that involved the serial sex murders of children. How did Myra become such a monster? Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were sadosexual killers. These particular murderers become hooked on inflicting torture on their victims. Their pleasure is gained in the perverse game of cat and mouse, stalking, entrapment, and killing of their victims. In the case of Brady and Hindley, their favored prey were children. So how did a seemingly normal child grow into an adult so perverse that she would gain pleasure from the sexual abuse and murder of children? Myra Hindley was born on Thursday, July 23, 1942. Just another child in a world of terraced houses and factories in the poor working-class area of Gorton in Manchester, England. Myra was the first child of Bob and Nellie Hindley. Initially, as a placid child, it was no trouble. When her sister Maureen was born four years later, the situation changed. Mr. and Mrs. Hindley found bringing up two children too difficult and sent Myra off to live with her grandmother. Some people try to make a lot of the fact that she didn't actually live at home with mom and dad, but she lived on the next street with her grandma. One would say it was a very, very loving life for Myra. Myra felt she'd made a lifelong friend. One sunny afternoon, Michael asked Myra to go swimming with him at the local reservoir. She was unable to go and tragically Michael drowned, which was an unfortunate event that local boy Lawrence Jordan witnessed. It was not long after Michael's death that Myra left school. On her 17th birthday, Hindley became engaged to Ronnie Sinclair, a local boy who worked at the co-op. However, Myra's apparent contentment with her ordinary life didn't last long. Part of the time, what Myra wanted was a classic husband and two kids, which all the girls around her aspired to have, and also there was another part of her that really didn't want to move on with such a life. According to Dr. David Holmes, a criminologist, stated that Myra Hindley was brought up by her grandmother to have a certain sense of self-importance. 
However, Myra did require more from life than simply two or four children and a marriage. He said that for some women, they require a certain amount of violence and a certain S&M quality to their relationship, and Myra was of this type. Eventually, Myra landed a job as a typist secretary at Mill Woods, which was the place where she ultimately met Ian Brady. Ian Brady worked in the office at the time, and he completely ignored Myra for many months. He was aloof. She describes him as an extremely good-looking individual. Ian Brady was always well-dressed. He was quite an attractive and handsome man. Now, at this time, Myra became very quickly fascinated by him, and to prove her fantasy about him, she kept this very childish diary in which she wrote things like, He looked at me today, Ian spoke to me today, Ian is in a bad mood today, keeping track of the man in her head. However, Ian Brady, who was bisexual, finally gave Myra a chance. They got together at one Christmas party and became intimate from there on, and it was at that stage that he started to indoctrinate her into his views on politics, life, sex, and so on. That first night, Brady took her to see the Nuremberg Trials. As the week went by, he played her records of Hitler's marching songs and encouraged her to read some of his favorite books, such as Mein Kampf, crime and punishment, and the works of the Marquis de Sade. Hindley happily complied. She had waited for so long for something different, and now here it was. Myra's family was not keen on Ian from the very beginning. Ian's background had been more dysfunctional than Myra's. He was born in central Glasgow and as a result of an affair between his mother, a waitress, and a man whose identity we've never been completely sure about. When he was just two, he was fostered by a family who lived just nearby, and they brought him up to the best of their ability. However, when he became a teenager, he began to get involved in crime. Eventually, the courts in Glasgow said that he had to go and live with his mother, and since his mother at the time was living in Manchester, Ian Brady had to basically leave Glasgow and obviously ship his problem out there. Brady became Hindley's first lover and she was soon totally besotted with him, soaking up all of his distorted philosophical theories. She went from being an epic lucky girl to not wanting to speak to anyone or being around anyone. Myra became involved in all kinds of strange sadomasochistic sex, as Ian Brady didn't have a normal sexual appetite. Brady told Myra there was no God, so she stopped going to church. When he told her that rape and murder were the supreme pleasures, she did not question it. Her personality had become totally fused with his. Early in 1963, Brady put Hindley's blind acceptance of his ideas to the test. He began planning a bank robbery and needed her to be his getaway driver. Immediately, Hindley began driving lessons, joined the local rifle club, and purchased two guns. The robbery was never carried out, but Brady's purpose had been fulfilled. Myra had shown herself to be a willing partner in crime. They had so many wonderful dreams and schemes, and she was obviously very impressed by him. Unfortunately, what Brady actually had in mind was the destruction and torture of children, and she got swept along with it, and the poison infected her, and that was how they embarked on their first murder. Pauline Reed was on her way to a dance. She left home dressed in her pink party dress. Myra knew her. Myra pulled up in the car alongside her and asked Pauline if she would come and help her look for a glove. While Pauline got inside the car, Myra drove her up to the moors, with Ian Brady following on his motorcycle close behind. When they got to the moor, Pauline got out of the car and presumably went to look for the glove with Myra, and with that, Ian Brady then came up behind and hit her with a spade, killed her, and sexually assaulted her. Their second victim was John Kilbride, who went missing in 1963. He was on his way to the market when he got picked up by Myra. This time Myra led John Kilbride to Brady's car, where they also took him to the moor, killed him, and sexually assaulted him. John Kilbride was found with his underpants tied down at the bottom of his legs and then buried again close to the road. Their method of abducting and killing children worked. Myra and Ian were driven to try it again. Six months later, they chose 12-year-old Keith Bennett. In this case, Myra sighted the child from far off the South Street, picked him up, and they also killed and assaulted him. At this stage, Ian was living with Myra and her grandmother in Hattersley, which is Novus Bill Town near Hyde just outside Manchester, and they moved in, and the neighbors were very impressed by them. A further six months passed before the next abduction. The fourth victim was Leslie Ann Downey, a young girl that they picked up at a funfair in Manchester. 
Myra again persuaded her to come in the car and they took her home. This one was different because they took her back to their house in Hattersley. And there hasn't been an enormous amount of scope for torture, taking photographs, or making tape recordings. But now that they've got a victim actually in their own house, they can actually indulge in all of that and they ran a tape recorder, and this tape recording is perhaps one of the most shocking things you will ever hear. But it's also the thing that completely condemned Myra Hindley in court. Her voice was heard on the tape, telling the little girl to be quiet because clearly, she was very distressed and worried the neighbors might hear the girl crying. After killing Leslie Ann Downey that day, the next day they took her up to the moors and buried her. The killing of Leslie Ann Downey marked a significant change in the killing career of Myra Hindley. The risk and the confidence to actually kill somebody within feet and inches of neighbors rather than out there on the moors were things she found very exciting. It would be another 10 months before Leslie Ann's body was discovered on the moors in a shallow grave with her clothing at her feet. Even with the damning evidence mounting against them, Brady and Hindley denied murdering Leslie A. Ann, as in the case of Edward Evans, they attempted to implicate David Smith. They claimed that Smith had brought the girl to the house so that Brady could photograph her. As far as they were concerned, Leslie Ann had left their house unharmed with Smith. The evidence that linked Brady and Hindley to the murder of John Kilbride, while not as overwhelming, was sufficient to charge them. They found the name John Kilbride in Brady's handwriting written in his notebook and a photograph of Hindley on John's grave on the moors. Despite all their efforts, the police were unable to find the bodies of the other two missing children or any evidence to link Brady and Hindley to their disappearance. Ian Brady was charged with the three murders of the ones the police had the bodies of. That was Leslie Ann Downey, John Kilbride, and Edward Evans. Myra was charged with Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans' death, and also for being an accomplice to the killing of John Kilbride. So Ian Brady received three life sentences, and Myra received two life sentences. Myra was taken to Holloway Prison. Even in prison, Ian Brady's hold over Myra Hindley continued for the first few years of their incarceration. They constantly wrote to each other and even requested permission to marry. The rift that developed between them was gradual, stemming mainly from their differing responses to their imprisonment. Brady quickly accepted his sentence and soon settled into prison life, whereas Hindley continued to assert her innocence, maintaining her claim that Brady and Smith were responsible for the murders. But the recordings of the tape proved otherwise, as they constantly heard her telling the little girl to shut her mouth while Ian was inflicting pain on the girl. At this point, her mother was convinced she was innocent, her sister was also convinced she was innocent, and everybody around her believed her innocence. In Myra's mind, her story was in place regardless of her innocence, and so she would gather together in 1970, Hindley broke off all contact with Brady. His hold on her was completely broken by the realization that she would never see him again. Seven years later, more than ten years after her imprisonment, Hindley began a campaign to win her freedom. A crusade that continued until the day she died, unlike Ian, who never actually applied for parole. He was willing to serve his sentence, at least. He knew what he'd done, and he didn't want to come out of prison. Hindley's application for parole was delayed for another three years. When Hindley's plea was finally heard in 1985, 20 years since she was first imprisoned, it was rejected. The Home Secretary announced that Hindley's case would not be heard again for at least another five years. Ultimately, she hoped she would be able to get out of prison, and that was probably her long-term objective. At the end of 1986, Hindley changed her tactics. Instead of continuing to plead her innocence, she made a full public confession. She now admitted both her knowledge of and involvement in all five murders, including those of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. She was cooperative and prepared to point out every areas of interest to the police and also give them pretty good clues as to where the bodies may be. For Myra Hindley, this was actually keyed off by her lawyer, who said that unless she did appear to the public as a reformed character, release would probably never, ever happen. Apparently, you can identify Myra's self-interest in all this, which wasn't genuine remorse. Keith's body has never been found, but Hindley's confession already gave his family some indication of how he died. Hindley had lured him into the car with a request for assistance in loading some boxes. Once at Saddleworth Moor, 
Brady had taken Keith down to the Cuddy, where he raped and then strangled him, burying him somewhere nearby. At the time of her confession, Hinley's solicitor expressed her belief that her chances of parole were greatly enhanced by her display of remorse. While in prison, Myra rediscovered her faith in Catholicism. She continued to express remorse for her crime, saying, I ask people to judge me as I am now and not as I was then. Now, as we actually know, a lot of people turn to religion in prison to impress one group of people in particular, and there's the parole board. According to Christ for Barry D., every killer in America must be on a journey into the light, must have seen Christ, and the first thing they do on Sunday is queue up for tea and biscuits in the church. The aim of these criminals is to walk free in life, and she wanted to be free the rest of her entire life. Oh well, we are very certain that if Myra Hindley had never met Ian Brady, she would never have been involved in murder. She would not have moved heaven and earth to do anything to please him. Without the influence of Ian Brady, it is very unlikely that Myra Hindley would have been able to kill another person. However, her search for a stimulating and exciting life may have ended up with her being with some drug dealer some bank robber who would give her an exciting life but wouldn't necessarily have involved her in one-to-one -one killing. On November 15, 2002, at the age of 60, Myra Hindley died from respiratory failure arising from a serious chest infection. She'd suffered a suspected heart attack two weeks earlier. Now, we know that Myra Hindley was not born to kill, but she was rather placed in a circumstance where an element that she was born with enabled her to continue and kill. In all, Myra wouldn't have gone through all this, and those children would possibly still be alive, doing great with their families, and most of them with their children, wives, and husbands. But wait, what are your thoughts about Myra? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section below, and don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching and see you in our next video.